Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. I didn't bring any notes, but um, I can tell you that uh, our speaker uh, is author Sally Svensson. And uh, we, I have, we have worked with her before uh, a while ago. We helped her with uh, another book uh, called uh, Adirondack Churches. And, um, and uh, so I will let her talk about herself and uh, her background and, uh, and then start uh, talking and we will be uh, doing the recording. So enjoy. Yes. Well, next week, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway, I'm Sally Spencer, and I'm here to talk about my latest book, which is called Can you be Louder, please. Right, Adirondack, yeah. Church, Adirondack, Adirondack yeah. Photographers from 1850 to 1950. And it's essentially 225 biographies of photographers who worked for, for some time in the Adirondacks. And I've tried to kind of key it tonight to Wilmington, and but I will start a little off about talking generally. So I'm going to be reading this. Okay, I say here, I'm going to start this evening's presentation by giving a little background to my writing about a century's worth of Adirondack photographers. Before I started the project, I had already written two books on Adirondack subjects, one on the history of churches and the other on the history of Blacks in the region. In the course of working on both books, I spent a lot of time looking for photographs with which to illustrate them. I then began to think about that it might be handy to know something about the photographers who took the pictures. This would at least make it easier to more or less date the images. There was a particular one photo photograph I came upon in a regional collection in connection with a Black history book that really bothered me. It's a lovely picture of Black men and women working in a field. It's taken by a known, photographer from Saranac Lake by the name of Edmund Stark. The image was assumed to have been captured in nearby Lake Placid, in Bloomingdale, or in Vermontville, all three of which had a number of Black residents at the time. It was used as an illustration in just about every article and book referring to Adirondack Blacks written over the previous 25 years. By the time I was looking at this photo, though, I knew something about the Black communities in all three areas. And there just seemed to be too many people in this picture. There was also what sort of looked like a couple of mules standing in the background, which are not really famously Adirondack working animals. So I started digging around, and I discovered that, yes, Mr. Stark, the photographer, was indeed Adirondack-based, but he spent winters working as a photographer at a hotel in Camden, South Carolina. <laughs> so, of course, it turns out that the archives down there have a number of pictures by Mr. Starter, which make more sense in terms of that individual picture. So, while I was now convinced that this was not a regionally based photograph, not everyone with an interest in Adirondack Black history was easily persuaded. Eventually, a forestry professor at Paul Smith was called in. He determined that most of the trees in the background were low quality pines, which is not a famous Adirondack tree. So everybody was finally content with the, with, with the answer to this. So that brings me to the book about Adirondack photographers. The book is essentially a brief history of the development of photography and a biographical dictionary of some 225 of them. It seemed that a reasonable approach to this evening's talk would be to key it to photographs relevant to Wilmington. So in a few minutes, I will do so. But before then, I thought I'd whip through a two-minute history of early photography in case there are any of you who are not familiar with the art forms of early years. We begin with the daguerreotype, which was invented in France and named for Louis Daguerre, who announced the discovery in 1839. I'd like to read from a short, effusive description of this new way of seeing the world written by an editor of New York City's Knickerbocker magazine in 1839. As he described it, quote, we have seen the views taken in Paris by the daguerreotype and have no hesitation in avowing that they are some of the most remarkable objects of curiosity and admiration in the arts that we have ever beheld. Let a reader suppose himself standing in the middle of Broadway with a looking glass held perpendicularly in his hand in which is reflected the street with all that therein is. Then let him take the glass into the house 
and find the impression of the entire view in the softest light and shade vividly retained upon its surface. This is the daguerreotype. It's hard to, re to realize from our vantage point what a history-making leap this was. The daguerreotype technique produced unique positives directly onto silvered copper plates. And its early exposure times were up to 10 minutes long, 10 seconds long. The daguerreotype process was at first used only for outdoor views, preferably on non-windy days. But as technology and technique improved, it became primarily, but not exclusively, used for indoor portraits during the 20 years in which it was published. <laughs> the first American daguerreotype studio opened in New York City in 1840. Itinerant daguerreotypists began visiting the Adirondacks not long afterward. An early arrival, George Brown Jr., announced in February 1842 that he had taken rooms in a Plattsburgh hotel and would be happy to wait upon all who wish to procure correct likenesses. Some transient daguerreotypists worked the region in horse-drawn chassis topped by box-like structures containing small chambers with side or skylights to illuminate portrait settings, as well as developing rooms. Settling in small population centers, they stayed around long enough to exhaust the local market and then moved on. Few early practitioners stuck with the business and few signed their images. By 1860, photographers were using a new process to produce well-defined negatives on glass that could be, sorry, I'm taking off my glasses, infinitely reproduced on paper at lower cost. While affecting a revolution in photography, I am going to take them off. The preparation of the plates on which the capture, on which the capture was made was cumbersome and had to be done just before making them. So too was developing them, which required about a half an hour per plate to be done immediately after the photo was taken. This new method of taking pictures, nevertheless quickly displaced all forms of single image capture and was used up until 1880. In 1871, a vast improvement was made in, in processing images with the development of the gelatin dry plate negative on glass a technique that meant that plates would be prepared well in advance of one of use and develop at leisure. Photographers began it. I can't tell whether it is on or off. <laughs> well, the privacy. Photographers began to produce Adirondack landscape images around 1855. The most popular early format was lands for landscapes was the stereo view, which consisted of a cardboard mount bearing two nearly identical photographs mounted side by side. These were captured with a specialized camera featuring two lenses spaced roughly two and a half inches apart from one another on a horizontal plane, so that when you saw them together, they would look three-dimensional. And we are first slide, please. Okay. Uh, this image, which is entitled Campfire at Adirondacks, was taken by George F. Gates from Watkins, now Watkins Glen, Schuyler County, in the late 1860s or early 1870s, and is in the collection of the Cable Museum. It's pretty easy to see here how there's a line down the middle and how this tree on the left is obviously taken much further to the left for the next one, which is set in the As I say, when you put them through a particular machine called a stereoscope, it would bring it together in a three dimension. Reaching the peak of popularity in the mid-1870s, stereo views were largely displaced by the early 1880s by individually mounted photographs. Wilmington, despite being a small community, was a hotbed of Adirondack photographic activity from photography's early days. It may sound surprising, but you will see why. This was because it was home to an important tourist attraction, White Face Mountain, the fifth highest mountain in New York State, and offering stunning 360, 360 degree views from its summit. The tourists who climbed White Face or just came to look at the mountain from close up were of great interest to the growing number of commercial photographers who hoped to market images to them of the mountain 
scenic surroundings in which the mountain sat and the hotels and boarding houses in which Toro stayed. Thus, quite a few photographers passed through Wilmington during the 100 years of the I'm going to talk about just a few of them. Next slide, please. No shame. You have this on your own. And she didn't point out it from the same design of the So I'm somewhere I have written. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, anyway, anyway. Um, Housley was one of the first, or perhaps the first person, to take pictures of Wilmington, both a portrait photographer and a landscape photographer. Housley was born in Jay and was only the second photographer to install himself permanently in the animals. He did so with the opening of Housley's skylight to barrier type rooms in Keysville in 1851. He began offering stereograph views by 1869. A list of his views published around 1874 included eight white face mountain views. This early stereo of the white face mountain house, established by 1871, was taken by Towsley. I would guess not long after the hotel opened. Towsley worked out of Keysville until retiring in about 1868. So, early stereo. Next slide. Certainly the most prolific 19th century landscape photographer of the Adirondacks in general was Glenn Spall's based Seneca Ray Stoddard. His total output ran into the thousands of images and his sales of photographs into the tens of thousands. He also produced annual guidebook books, got annual guidebooks, as well as more than 20 other books, and gave illustrated lectures on the Adirondacks. Stoddard took a number of photographs in Poland. This one, titled simply White Face Mountain from Wilmington, comes probably from the 1880s. Sartre was particularly famous for his broad landscape papers and has often been referred to as a luminist, a term first used in connection with Hudson River School of Painting in 1850 to 1875. Luminism is described as characterized by order, open foregrounds, deep, hazy backgrounds, and stillness of mood, all of which we see here. Next slide, please. This and the following image, both by Stoddard, show other ways in which Stoddard incorporated White House Face Mountain into this work. This photograph is entitled Wilmington and White Face Mountain. The left hand portion of the photo, by the way, was used as the front cover photo from my 2006 book on Atlanta churches. Next slide. This photograph is titled White Face Summit and shows us yet another approach to photographing White Face Mountain. Stoddard, after his death, was eulogized as having done, quote, as much to popularize the Adirondacks as any man who ever did. Next slide. With them along. <laughs> okay, this George W. Baldwin was another prolific regionally based photographer whose years of productivity were similar to those of Stoddard, roughly 1871 or 19. Born in Connecticut. He spent his early adulthood in Essex, Essex County, where he was a sailor. He was born in Jay and in 1870 census, when he was 19, he was recorded as an artist living in his parents' Elizabeth Town farm. He later had studios at one time or another in Port Henry, Keysville, Plattsburgh, and Saranac Lake. Baldwin was a prolific landscape photographer as well as a portrait photographer. And by 1879, he had on offer between four and 500 views, some 200 of which were on the sale of Esme. The single image from, I would guess, the 1880s was labeled Drive Through Wilmington Notch, mm -hmm. and it's from the Saranac Lake Library collection. While it's not particularly site specific, I chose to show it as it illustrates an interesting technique hand finishing negatives and photographs with color paint. Unfortunately, the coloring did not show up well on the scan, but imagine if you would, a great many of the leaves in the photo delicately touched with yellow brown paint, which is just autumn, which is clearly the season in which this photograph is Next slide. This is one of my favorites. 
This lovely Wilmington landscape was taken in the mid 1990s by photographer Frederick W. Rice. Rice had an unusual history. Born in Connecticut, he spent his early adulthood in Essex, Essex County, where he was a sailor family. In 1876, he re relocated to Saranac Lake and became a well known guide builder while developing a second career as a photographer, focusing on local landscapes, outdoor groups, and photo finishing in a studio above his boat shop on the shore of Lower Saranac Lake. Rice's life life changed dramatically after the sen sensational 1900 murder of his uncle, William Marsh Rice, who made a fortune from investments in real estate in Texas and Louisiana. As one of his children's uncles, one of his childless uncles, many collateral descendants, Rice was awarded $75,000 in 1907, equivalent to nearly $3 million today. From a state that also financed the launch of Houston's Rice Institute, Institute later Rice University. Rice gave up, obviously, guidebook making, as well as photography, and moved to Washington State, where he became a Seattle businessman dealing in loans and real estate for his own account. Next slide. This photograph of Notch House in Wilmington Hot, does anyone recognize it? Have you ever seen it? it? Was taken by William Cheeseman, who was born in Chasey Clinton County in 1871 and owned a photograph gallery between 1894 and 1902 in Osceola Forks. This image comes from the office of the Osceola Forks historian. Cheeseman called himself a quote, view artist, for his quote. And following the tourist dollar, he permanently wrote relocated his photography business to Lake Placid in 1902. By 1920, he had largely transitioned into retailing and real estate. The site on which Notch House was built is apparently now covered by the Notch Lake Placid Highway. It was marked with a stone and bronze tablet mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, this image is likely to have been taken at White Mouse, White Case Mountain. It's from what I understand, the log slide maintained by the J and J Rogers Company of the Seagull Forks began on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Discovering the full name of this image's photographer was one of the high points of my early research into Adirondack photographers. For it turned out that the first initial in the photographer's name, F. A. Van Sant, as it appeared in connection with the occasional turn of the 20th century image. In New York State Forest Commission reports, it's Florence. Mm -hmm. Thus, I stumbled upon one of the only 10 women I found in the course of researching this book. Florence was born in photography in Philadelphia in 1869, but followed her Methodist minister husband work in his 1890 ministerial assignment for the Adirondacks as a 21 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. Her husband contracted tuberculosis shortly after arriving in the region. He resigned his ministry. And in 1896, the couple settled in Jay. There, Florence supported them both by teaching music, writing about bird and animal life, and photography until her husband's death in 1908. Next slide. Van Sant's largest body of photographic work related to the Roger Company logging operation, as was the last image in this one, taken of a lumber camp somewhere near New Salem. Her primary clients were the New York State Education Department and the American Museum, Museum of National History in New York City, which offered a public lecture service. Interestingly, however, Van Sant did not did take the occasional portrait. <laughs> Next slide. Karen Peters found this Van Sant image in an album in her family's Marshall collection, although she doesn't know who it might have been off. It's interesting that the portrait was taken, but not in a studio, which Van Sant doesn't appear to have maintained, but in a natural setting. Several years after her first husband's death, Van Sant married another Jay resident, quite a few years younger than herself. With him, she ran a dairy farm and a summer cottage community called Heart's Desire Camps until her death in 1953. Is that name when we go? Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> okay, next slide. This photograph is from the collection of the Library of Congress and was taken by William Henry Jackson, who was born in the Adirondacks and became part owner of the Detroit Publishing Company. This was a pioneering company in the business of creating colored postcards 
in black and white negatives, 1897. Jackson was, however, best known for his earlier career as one of the finest photographers of the Northwest. And that is really where you'll hear his name today. Jackson made a trip through the Adirondacks in 1900 on behalf of the Detroit Publishing Company, where he recorded about 90 views which by Detroit for postcards. The company created some 16,000 different postcard views of primarily scenery around the United States. This image is entitled White Face Mountain for Wilmington Road. The company's most prolific years were between 1902 and 1910, with 1904 representing perhaps two of Jackson stopped taking photographs in 1902 and became plant manager for Detroit. He retired in 1924 at about the same time that the company effectively closed down. He made two visits to the Adirondacks when he was in his 90s and was pleased to be able to identify the site of the Blue Farm in which he had spent his early years. Next slide, please. Okay. This image is particularly interesting because it was taken by the only photographer during the 100 years I covered to specifically identify himself as based in the moment. His name was Albert Allen. He was born in Germany and immigrated to the United States in 1897, where he spent the rest of his working life as a butler to members of New York City's well-to-do German-speaking Jewish community. I don't know the exact circumstances of his being in Wilmington, though it was probably in a service capacity. But Altag passed the summers between 1909, 1905 and 1909 here, where he took a number of landscape photographs and marketed them, marketed them as prints and real photo postcards to local residents and visitors. This little building, known as Camp Welcome, was built as an overnight shelter somewhere near the summit of White Face by an enterprising local man who provided simple accommodations to climbers who wanted to spend the night close to or near Mountain Tom. Next slide. Next. Can I answer yeah. Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> That's my great, great uncle, Ashley Mayman. Oh, really? Or is he the one who was this his? He worked, for, he worked for the White Face Mountain Tops as a guide. Yeah. And brought people out to it. So mm -hmm. this was sort of, does this belong to the White Face Mountain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, let's have the next one. Okay, this image shows not very well. Stan mm -hmm. Altag used on his regional level, which clearly mentions his Wilmington location. There is, by the way, another Altag photograph taken at the same time at Camp Welcome, which is in the Wilmington Historical Society. Next slide, please. Here is another real photo of Alatan years ago. This one of the White Face Mountain House is it looked in 1909 when the postcard was made. It shows a very different looking structure from the one we saw in that first house area view, primarily for the addition of the third story. Alatan gave up photography in 1913, advertising his company's complete camera outfit for sale in a New York City newspaper and the sacrifice price, quote, due to failing eyesight. Quote. He thereafter traveled extensively with his longtime employer and during World War II worked for the War Department's Office of Censorship. Alatag retired to California where he eventually lost his eyesight altogether. He died of war in the state at the age of 96. Interestingly, a lot of the research I found on him was the foundation started by his employer in the New York Public Library, which has an entire file devoted to Alatag. He was originally given a pension, but because California kept claiming it for his support, they just decided to stop giving it to him. <laughs> well, California could take a little job at the end of his life. So, next slide. Okay, I am taking a bit of a side trip here to show you this real photo postcard image of a store in Vermontville. It was produced by the Eastern Illustrating Publishing Company, which was founded in Belfast, Maine in 1909. Up to four photographers traveled around the country taking pictures for the company every summer. And during its peak year, 1920, the company published a million postcards per year. Among the more than 50,000 black and white images, Eastern Illustrated reported, some 11 highest images were New York State. A good sized portion of them generally taken after 1915 of the Adirondacks. 
Next slide. Okay, I showed you the previous image because I wanted to see this detail in the postcard showing an automobile with its trunk for taking pictures in the around that region. The photograph was taken sometime between 1914 and 1925. Okay, next slide. Okay, Eastern Illustrated Company's business model was based on reporting bird's eye views and details of small towns and rural areas not documented by other photographers. Particularly, there were side inns and tourist homes, like the Hotel Olden from here, as well as grocery stores, gasoline stations, industrial sites. And you want to come in and sit for your okay? And camp with us. Next slide. <laughs> There's a bench right here, if you want to Eastern's photographers stayed at the same modest hostels and campgrounds as did the tourists whose business they were at. They did a real service to the Adirondacks, capturing bits of local life that were not thought important by other reporters. This view is at Wilmington's Mountain View Cat Cottage. Next slide, please. I must show someone. But while the company name is not always recorded on postcard backs, it was always the dead. Of course, we're always identified. Let me just go back and see that. Easy that easy. It's too much to Identifiable through their labeling style, as is this one. Hand printed on the negative with neat capital letters showing as white unfinished photographs and stating the subject's name, its location, and the number or number of letter code. You can tell them anytime, and you're often going to find them without, without any kind of information on the back. It's society known. New cards, new cards added after 1940 by machine printed labels. Next slide, please. Okay, this image takes us into the early 1930s, an important event for Wilmington construction of the five mile long White Face Memorial Highway. The photographer was Dwight Church. A prolific photographer who worked out of Canton, St. Lawrence County, from around 1910 until 1970. Church got his pilot's license in 1929 and thereafter logged over 2,000 hours and 75,000 miles, taking pictures of Adirondack views. Most of Church's post mid 1920s landscape photos were reproduced as real photo postcards in black and white or sepia tones. Marketed at first, as the work of the Park Photo Company and the $5 Bill Photo Company, Church shortened his operation's name in the late 1920s to the $5 photo, photo Company. By World War II, the real photo views were the most commonly found postcards on store racks throughout much of the Adirondack region. Church left behind more than 13,000 images, an important pictorial record of northern New York at the century. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the last one I have to show you this evening. It's obviously of the completed White Face Mountain View, not um, White Face Mountain Highway, and uh, the classic um, where we were standing. It was, it was uh, taken by, it was taken in 1937 by Edward Bachler, sorry, not great. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1999, Dr. contracted tuberculosis at the age of 18 while working in the wartime capital. After struggling with the disease for several years, he relocated to Saranac Lake, where he was confined to bed for 18 months after his arrival. Bachler mastered photography in a local occupational rec recreational therapy class and soon began winning prizes in amateur competitions. He stayed on in Saranac Lake and eventually became a photographer for the Saranac Laboratory, facility devoted to tuberculosis research. He also developed a hobby interest in color photography after its 1936 invention and sold bucolic images for use on brochures, greeting cards, and cards. Other commercial photographers passed through Wilmington during the 100 years covered in this book. And the local and local amateur photographers, of course, also captured Wilmington life and scene. I hope that this brief look at a few Wilmington images has provided some feel for the development of photography in the region 
and the wide variety of people who worked, at least for a little while, as professionals in the field. They were a very and very interesting lot, and I, as you can probably tell, thoroughly enjoyed researching and writing about it. So that was it. That's all the <laughs> All the little things sort of messed up. Right. So, any questions? Sally, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to acquire all this and make it? Um, yeah. Or, And uh, you can see the slides are very good, so I can make a lot of a lot of a lot of the comments that we had out ended up in all the As soon as I got the business in 1949, we started selling merchandise to kids who were advertising in the Syracuse newspaper, selling trucks that they had a little bit. So those were just interesting artifacts. 
because one of the persons who is kind of an expert in standing workshop is here tonight. Yes, I know. <laughs> I arranged my trip today for her. As I was saying earlier, her late husband was a college classmate of my husband's. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes. So it's not surprising that a lot of the early photographs would be of the, the scenic wonders here. Um, in the course of your research, have you come across pictures of this rural life here? Farm not really. Nobody was really taking pictures. Why would you want to take a picture of something milking a cow? That's your cousin. I mean, I'm not a family, but not even cousin. I notice in a lot of the White Face Mountain pictures, you can hardly see the mountains. Is some of that I'm just fading, do you know? No, I think, I mean, as I, when I mentioned Stoddard, he said they all had crazy backgrounds. Yeah, I suspect he was probably all with a lot of kids. Yeah, just because some you didn't even see them. Yeah. I, mean, it, exactly. it, I don't know if it's the function of projection, but you can hardly no, see This is a little it. bit fuzzy, but not, uh -huh. not very yeah. fuzzy. Okay. Did you have any pictures of High Falls Forge? Um, I didn't actually look for pictures of High Falls Forge in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have many, many pictures I have seen of a city. That mm -hmm. was the most photographs I from the 1870s through the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, other, any other questions? I guess, I guess in your book uh, that you do, that you have, um, is most of it seen, scenic you know, landscapes, or is it a kind of a combination? I only, there are only 75 photos in it, and I did that because I wanted oh, to be in the mm -hmm. And uh, once you start doing lots of layout, then it is. So Syracuse is classically expensive when it comes to books. And this was underwritten by several people, including the New Haven, something in New Haven, Connecticut. I have no, no idea why. But this book, for example, which is paid back. Wholesale costs thirty four ninety nine. I mean, retail costs thirty nine, which I think is a lot of money for people. But that's not serious works. Mm -hmm. And this one is, I think, it's a thirty one ninety five. Yeah. From Syracuse seems to it's just because that's how the university presses work, especially mm -hmm. small regional presses, which Syracuse is, and which those of us who specialize in analog that stuff for the most part of the planet can find it. Thank you.